All the Young Dudes Chapter 4 First Year The Full Moon Sunday the 5th of September, 1971 Remus got through the rest of the week by ignoring the other boys as much as he could. This was a technique he'd picked up at St Edmunds. It was better not to be noticed, and best if no one knew anything about you at all. He still got the odd dead armour, his head shoved in the bogs, but on the whole, no one ever made an effort to bother him. James, Sirius and Peter were not at all like St Eddie's boys, of course. They were what Matron would call well-bred. Sirius and James especially seemed to come from money. He could tell from the way they talked about their homes, as well as the way they spoke, every vowel and consonant clearly pronounced. Remus listened carefully, and resolved to stop dropping his H's. It wasn't just their accents, but what they said. Remus had grown up with adults constantly telling him to be quiet, and with boys who picked on you for being a swat if you said any more words than necessary. James and Sirius spoke like characters in a novel, their language full of descriptive metaphors and scathing sarcasm. Their rapid-fire wit was much more intimidating than a punch in the face, Remus thought. At least that was over quickly. He'd so far avoided the other boys by going for walks around the castle. At St Edmund's, he'd had very little personal liberty and spent much of his time locked in rooms. At Hogwarts, it seemed there was nowhere you couldn't go and Remus was determined to investigate every inch of the bizarre landscape. They'd been provided with maps to help them find their classrooms but Remus found his sorely lacking and overly simplified. It did not list, for example, a secret passageway he had found which led from the dungeons to the first floor girls lose. He had no idea why on earth anyone would need to get between the two, and the first time he used it, he was accosted by a particularly irritating ghost who squirted him with hand soap. It would also have been helpful, Remus reasoned, to animate the map in the same way the paintings were, then at least you could keep track of the ridiculous moving staircases. He was sure one of the rooms moved as well. It never seemed to be in quite the same place. By the time Sunday afternoon rolled around, Remus was dreading Monday, which would not only be the first day after the full moon, but the first day of lessons. After dinner, which Remus spent alone, a few seats away from Sirius, James and Peter, he made his way quickly to McGonagall's office. She was waiting for him, along with the school nurse, who he'd been introduced to already. She was a kind, pleasant sort of woman, if a little fussy. "'Good evening, Mr Lupin,' McGonagall smiled. "'Thank you for being so prompt. Come along.' To Remus's surprise, the two women led him not to the dungeons, as he'd thought they might, but outside the castle, towards a very large twisted tree. The Whomping Willow was a recent addition to the grounds. Dumbledore had explained in his speech at the beginning of the year that it had been donated by an ex-pupil. Remus thought that whoever had donated it must have really hated the school because the tree was not only terrifying in aspect, but mindlessly violent. As they approached, Professor McGonagall did something so incredible that Remus almost cried out in shock. She seemed to vanish, shrinking down suddenly, until she was no longer there at all. In her place was a sleek, yellow-eyed tabby cat. Madame Pomfrey gave no sign that she was surprised, as the cat ran forward towards the tree, which was flailing its branches like a child having a tantrum. The cat was able to run right up the trunk of the tree, escaping injury, and pressed a paw against one of the knots in the bark. The tree fell instantly still. Remus and Madame Pomfrey continued on, walking into a hollow beneath the tree, which Remus had never noticed before. Inside, McGonagall was waiting for them, a witch again. The passageway was dimly lit by torches giving off a greenish glow, and at the very end was a door. This opened into a small cottage, which looked long abandoned. The windows were boarded up and the doors bolted. Here we are, McGonagall tried to sound pleasant, though it seemed a very grim place. Now, I hope you understand that we cannot stay with you. 
But if you would like Madame Pomfrey to wait outside until the transformation is complete? Rima shrugged. I'll be okay. How do I get back in the morning? I'll pop by as soon as the sun rises, Madame Pomfrey assured him. Patch you up and have you off to your lessons before anyone even notices you're gone. She smiled, but her eyes looked sad. It made Remus uncomfortable. But then it was getting to that point in the evening where everything made him uncomfortable. His hair itched, his skin felt too tight, his temperature rose. You'd better go, he said quickly, retreating into the bare room. There was a little cot against one of the walls with clean sheets. It looked as though it had been put there for him. The two women left, locking the door heavily behind him. He heard McGonagall muttering again, and wondered what sort of spells she was placing on the house. Whatever they were, it was better than that awful silver plating. He sat on the bed for a moment, then got up again, restless. He paced the room. Sometimes it felt as though the wolf crept into his mind before it got hold of his body, and as darkness fell outside, his senses became sharper, the hot swell of hunger beginning in his belly. Remus removed his clothes quickly, not wanting to rip them. A dull throb started in his joints, and he lay down on the bed. This was the worst part. His heartbeat was thudding in his ears, and he could swear he heard his tendons creaking as they stretched, his bones and teeth grinding against each other as they elongated, his skull splitting and reshaping. He groaned and hissed until the pain grew too much. Then he screamed. He could only hope that he was far enough away from the school that no one would hear him. All in all, it took about twenty minutes, though he'd never actually timed it. Things became foggy afterwards. He couldn't always remember what happened once he became the wolf. That first night at Hogwarts was a blur, and he woke up with less injuries than usual. He suspected he had sniffed around the unfamiliar territory, testing its boundaries. He must have tried to throw himself at the doors or windows at some point, because he had a patchwork of bruises down his left side for days afterwards. Transforming back was just as unpleasant, a crushing, tightening feeling all over which left him breathless and aching. He wiped the tears from his eyes and crawled onto the cot, grateful for an hour's sleep before the sun rose completely. Madame Pomfrey returned, as promised, speaking in soothing tones as she lay her cool hands on his fevered brow. "'I don't like the look of you,' she said, as he opened his sleepy eyes. "'It's madness, thinking you can start a full day of school like this. You're exhausted!' No one had ever expressed such concern for him before, and it struck him uneasily. He pushed her away, pulling on his clothes. I'm fine. I want to go. She made him drink something before letting him get up. It tasted cold and metallic, but he did feel better afterwards. He hurried up to Gryffindor Tower to get his uniform on as fast as possible. He didn't want to miss breakfast. He was famished. Where were you? James accosted him as soon as he burst into their room. Three other boys were all up and dressed, looking immaculate, apart from James's hair, which always stuck up at the back. Nowhere. Remus pushed past to get his things. Are you okay? Sirius asked, glancing away from the mirror where he was smoothing down his own hair. Yeah, James added, watching Remus carefully. You look a bit weird. Remus scowled at them. Piss off. We're just being nice, Peter said, hands on his hips. The three of them stared at Remus, who was about to remove his t-shirt when he remembered his bruises. What? he growled at them. You're going to watch me get dressed. You posh boys are all a bunch of poofs. He marched into the bathroom with his clothes and slammed the door. After a few moments, he heard Peter whining that he was hungry, and they all left. Chapter 5. First Year Potions Friday, 10th of September, 1971. By the end of his first week of lessons, Remus had lost ten house points, learnt one spell, and gained another bruise, this time on his chin. The first few lessons were okay, they were introductory, and while Lily Evans spent each class furiously scribbling down pages and pages of notes, nobody else seemed too bothered. 
they were set a few simple pieces of homework, but Remus made a plan to pretend he'd forgot to make a note of it, if anyone asked. Charms was the most exciting. The tiny professor enchanted a pile of pine cones to whiz around the room to everyone's delight. After a few goes at the spell themselves, Lily had levitated her pine cone at least three feet in the air, and Sirius had got his to spin like a top until it got out of control and smashed a window. James, Peter and Remus had less luck, but Remus was sure his had jumped once or twice. Transfiguration was just as interesting, but much more serious, as it was led by Professor McGonagall. There would be no practical work at all during the first week, she explained, but she would be setting lots of homework in order to gauge their ability levels. History of magic was absolutely dire, and the less said about it the better. Rumours struggled not to fall asleep as the ghostly Professor Bins floated up and down the aisles, reeling off dates and names of battles. He too set homework, two chapters of reading from the set text. Sirius rolled his eyes at this and muttered to James. Surely everyone's already finished a history of magic, it's kid stuff. James nodded, yawning. Remus felt sick. He hadn't opened even one of the books in his trunk yet, except to rip the first page from level one potions to spit his chewing gum into. He'd actually been looking forward to potions, hoping at least to see something blow up like in chemistry, but that turned out to involve a huge amount of reading too, and even worse, they had to share the class with the Slytherin first years. The professor leading potions was annoyingly cheerful and took almost half an hour just to read the register. Black, Sirius? Aha! There you are. Quite surprised at the sorting, my boy. Quite surprised. And I've had every one of the blacks in my house since I started teaching. Shan't take it personally, young Sirius. But I shall be expecting great things. Sirius looked like he wanted the ground to swallow him up. Slughorn called out a few names. A Potter? And a Pettigrew, huh? Well, well, along with Mr. Black here, this class is quite the pedigree, huh? Let me see. Lupin! I knew your father. Not one of mine, but a damn good duelist. Nasty business. Remus blinked. He wondered if Slughorn knew that he was a werewolf. The whole class was looking at him. They knew by now that he'd been raised in a children's home and that his father was magical. Remus suspected that Peter had told them. But no one had dared asking him much more. There seemed to be another rumour going round that he was violent and possibly in a gang. He was sure that James and Sirius were encouraging it too, though he found he didn't mind it too much. Fortunately, Slughorn wanted them to get started on practical work as soon as possible. Best thing is just to get stuck in, he smiled. Now, if we all work four to a cauldron, you can all take turns to follow the steps. Everyone clamoured to pair up. James, Sirius and Peter immediately claimed the cauldron at the very back of the room and were joined by Nathaniel Quince, a Slytherin boy who knew Potter and Pettigrew from home. Remus decided he would just wait until everyone had grouped off then see if he could get away with just hovering at the back for the rest of the lesson. No such luck. Remus, you can join us! Lily grabbed his wrist and pulled him over to a cauldron she was sharing with Severus Snape, her long-nosed friend Remus had met on the train, and Garrick Mulciber, a brutish, snub-nosed boy who Remus was a bit afraid of. Lily was already chattering away, laying out all of the ingredients and heating up the cauldron carefully. She was looking at Severus's book, which already had notes and scribbles all over the margins. Here are the desiccated snail eye stems, Lily shook a tiny jar. I think we need quarter of an ounce. You can be fairly liberal with them, Lily. They don't add much overall, Severus drawled, sounding bored. Lily measured them out anyway and tipped them into the bubbling brew. Mulciba then took the book and stirred for five minutes, taking instructions from Severus on how fast to go and in which direction. Then it was Remus's turn. Lily gave him the book. He stared at the page. He could see that there were instructions. He could make out maybe half of the words, but every time he thought he had a grasp on it, 
the letters seemed to shift on the page, and he was lost all over again. His cheeks grew hot, and he felt slightly sick. He shrugged, looking away. Oh, hurry up, Severus snapped. It's not as if it's difficult. Leave him alone, Sev, Lily chided. The book's covered in your notes. No wonder he can't find his place. Here, Remus. She flicked open her own brand new potions book. But it was no good. Remus shrugged. Why don't you do it, if you're so clever? He spat at Severus. Oh, Merlin, Severus's lips curled. You can read, can't you? I mean, even muggle schools teach you that, surely. Severus, Lily gasped. But the smug, dark-haired boy didn't have a chance to say anything else. Remus threw himself over the desk and into Severus, fists flying. He only had the element of surprise going for him. Mulciber grabbed his collar and yanked him back, pushing him square in the face in three seconds flat. Stop! Slughorn boomed. Everyone froze. The portly potions master stormed over. Get up, both of you! He shouted at the two boys on the floor. Snape and Remus climbed to their feet, chests heaving. Snape looked worse off by far, his hair ruffled and blood oozing from his nose. Remus had a rather sore chin from where Mulciber had hit him, but other than a rumpled uniform, he was fine. Explain yourselves, Slughorn shouted. They both looked at their feet. Mulciber was grinning. Lily was crying. Very well, the teacher said crossly. Detention for both of you. Two weeks. Ten points from Gryffindor and ten from Slytherin. That's not fair, James said suddenly from the back. Should be twice as many from Slytherin. It was two against one. From where I was standing, it was Mr Lupin who started it, Slughorn replied, but shook his head anyway. Still, you're quite right. Mulciba, five points for punching Remus. Violence does not solve violence, you know, as I've told your eldest brother on a number of occasions. Miss Evans, please take Mr Snape to the hospital wing. Lupin, you can clean up the mess you've made. Remus didn't know any cleaning spells, so he had to mop it up by hand. Slughorn even made him clean Snape's blood off the flagstones. Unfortunately, it being so soon after the full moon, the rich iron smell of it made his stomach growl. James, Sirius and Peter were waiting for Remus outside after the lesson was finished. Bloody brilliant, mate, James punched Remus lightly on the arm. The way you just went for him. Mulciber was out there bragging afterwards, told everyone what Snape said, Sirius added. You were right to do it. What a prat. Told... Everyone, Remus moaned. Don't worry, they're all on your side, James said. Well, except the Slytherins. Yeah, and who gives a toss about the Slytherins? Sirius grinned. Come on, it's dinner soon. Hungry? Starving, Remus grinned back. Chapter 6 First Year Revenge So, James said on a Sunday evening. How are we going to get back at them? Get who back? Peter asked without looking up, searching through his notes for something. They were in the Gryffindor common room, trying to do their homework for McGonagall. Fourteen inches on the basic laws of transfiguration. Sirius and James had finished theirs. Peter was at least six inches in, and Remus hadn't started. The Slytherins, James hissed. Keep up, Pete. All the Slytherins, Peter asked, sounding worried. Oh, only Snape and Mulciber, right? All of them, Sirius confirmed. He had just appeared from under the desk they were sharing, and presented a piece of parchment. Is this what you were looking for? Thanks. Peter grabbed it, relieved. I've nearly finished. Have you done it, Lupin? Sirius looked over. Remus had opened his book, but hadn't so much as looked at it. He'd considered cloistering himself away in the library one evening and trying to read it properly. He could read if he really, really focused, but the opportunity hadn't presented. And if he was honest, he just didn't want to. Ever since the potions lesson, the four of them had become real friends, and Remus didn't want to miss out. Nah, he shrugged in response to Sirius. Can't be bothered. 
Let us know if you need help. You can copy mine if you want. James pushed his across the desk. Remus pushed it back, gritting his teeth. I'm fine. I'm not stupid. No one said you were, James replied casually. Sirius was looking at him, though. Remus wanted to hit him, but he was trying not to lash out so much. James and Sirius sometimes play wrestled, but they never actually tried to hurt each other, like he had with Snape. Forcing himself to swallow his temper, Remus opted instead to change the subject. We could put itching powder in their beds, he offered. Someone had done that to him once. He had had a rash for a full week, and on the night of the full moon had torn at his skin more than usual. Or on their clothes, if we could figure out who does the laundry anyway. This had been a great matter of concern to Remus. Their dirty laundry appeared just to vanish and then resurface, cleaned and folded in their trunks. He'd never caught anyone else in the rooms, and couldn't understand it at all. I like it, James replied, chewing his quill. Anyone got any itching powder, though? The three boys shook their heads. Could order some from Zonko's, Sirius put in. If you let me borrow your owl, James. Mum confiscated mine after the sorting. I suppose, James replied. Wish we could do it sooner, though. You know, strike when the iron is hot. Don't need to buy itching powder, Remus said, suddenly having a brainwave. Do you reckon they have rosehip in the greenhouse? Yep, Peter spoke, head still bowed over his homework. For healing potions, uh, arthritis, I think. The hair inside it makes you itch, real bad, Remus explained, excited. Matron, the woman who runs the children's homes, she grows them, and if you get in trouble, she makes you seed them without gloves on. His fingertips itched just thinking about it. That's awful, James said. Good idea, though, Sirius grinned. Next break, we'll go and get a load of them. And then we can seed them with gloves on and put them in the Slytherin's bed sheets. Excellent. How are we going to get to the Slytherin dorms? Peter asked, finally finishing his work. Leave that to me, James smirked. Getting the rose hit was easy. They sent Peter, who was the only one of them who hadn't been given in detention yet, and was therefore under the least observation. Peter was small and good at going unseen. He crept into the greenhouse unnoticed during morning break and returned red-faced and gleeful with a jar full of rosehip under his cloak. Then they'd all locked themselves away in their shared bathroom to seed all of the buds. Under Remus's close instruction, they all wore their heavy dragonhide gloves to do this, taking extra care not to touch the seeds or fine little hairs. I can't wait to see the look on their faces, Sirius was grinning, sitting cross-legged on the floor next to James. Remus watched, sitting on the edge of the bathtub, James and Sirius's two dark heads bowed over the work. He was a little bit jealous of their friendship. They had so much in common, being raised into magic, both having grown up wealthy, both completely mad about Quidditch. In addition, it was clear that after only three weeks, James and Sirius had managed to secure a reputation as joint kings of the first years. Everyone listened to them when they spoke. Everyone laughed when they were funny. No one even got annoyed when they lost house points. Still, I don't know how we're going to sneak into the Slytherin dorms. Even Peter isn't that sneaky. Sirius glanced at James. He'd been trying to get him to reveal his plan, ever since the spectacled boy had mentioned it. Let me worry about that, was all James said. The seeds and hairs were then decanted into another jar, while the boys ended up eating the leftover rose hips over the course of the next week. It was a Tuesday evening when they finally had their chance. James decided that they would have to do it before everyone went to bed. He also decided that they ought to go to the Slytherin dorms separately to avoid being seen together and discovered. Remus personally thought this was overkill, but went along with it, not wanting to ruin the other boys' fun. They ate dinner much more quickly than usual that evening, before getting up from the table one at a time and leaving the hall. Peter looked so nervous Remus thought he might panic at the last minute and give them all away. 
he made sure to stay close to the smaller boy, just in case he had to cover his mouth or pull him back at some point. Sirius and James went first, of course, heading towards the girls' loos on the second floor, which rumours had told them led them to the dungeons. He'd thought about keeping that particular passageway to himself, but as he'd already found a few other good hiding places by then, he reasoned that letting them know about this one wouldn't hurt. After all, how often would he want to get to the dungeons? The ghost who lives in the toilets was, fortunately, in a quiet mood, though Remus could hear her sobbing softly in the last hall. Lead the way then, Lupin, James gestured grandly once Remus and Peter arrived. Sirius grabbed his arm. Wait, show us what you're planning first. James smirked that annoying grin he'd been sporting since Sunday. Oh, okay then. Here, hold this. He thrust the jar of rosehip seeds into Sirius's hands, pulling back his robes. He produced a very long, voluminous cloak, woven from the strangest-looking fabric Remus had ever seen, silvery grey and shimmering. No, Sirius gaped. You haven't, Potter, you bloody haven't. James was grinning so broadly now that Remus thought his face might split in two. The gangly boy winked at them all, then, with a flourish, swept the cloak over his head so that it covered him top to toe. He vanished. You jammy bastard, Sirius whooped. How come you've never told me? You never told me either, Peter squeaked, and I've known you forever. Where did you get it? James pulled the hood of his cloak down, so that his head appeared to float in mid-air. It made Remus feel a bit queasy. Been in the family for years, he said triumphantly. Dad let me bring it, as long as I didn't tell Mum. Lucky git, Sirius said, grabbing for some of the invisible material and rubbing it between his fingers. My parents would do anything for an invisibility cloak. I reckon we can all fit under it, James demonstrated, pulling it apart and raising his arms like a bat. Come on, let's all get nice and cosy. They all shuffled underneath the cloak, then tried waddling up and down the room a few times until they were able to walk comfortably together. Finally, trying not to giggle or whisper too much, the four invisible boys made their way to the dungeons. Rumours showed them which tiles to tap in order for the floor to open up in the third store from the left. How'd you find this? Remus, James whispered. It's genius. You come out behind one of them rugs they hang on the walls in the dungeons, Remus replied. I just looked behind it. Do you mean a tapestry? Peter asked. Um, suppose so. Remus was glad none of them could see his face. Shut up, Pettigrew, Sirius snapped. Remus felt a sharp kick hit the back of his ankle. Ow! he hissed, kicking back twice as hard. Bugger off! Sorry, Sirius yelped. Meant to get Peter, not you. Be quiet, all of you, James snapped. We're almost here. They waited quietly on their side of the tapestry, listening for footsteps in the corridor outside. Once James was satisfied that it was quiet, they all clambered out the passage. The dungeons were cool, dimly lit and cavernous. There was a strange dripping sound coming from somewhere. Perhaps the pipes. Where's the entrance? Sirius murmured. Behind that wall, Remus pointed, hoping they could see where he was aiming. It was a plain brick wall. How do you know? I've seen them go in before, Remus said hurriedly. He wasn't going to tell them that he knew there were 200 Slytherins on the other side because the scent of their blood and their magic was so strong he could almost taste it. Do you know the password? Nope. Damn. It's not curfew yet. Let's just wait. So they did, rather uncomfortably. Though the corridor was dank, it was unnecessarily warm underneath the cloak, especially with all four of them so close together. Fortunately, two seventh years came hurrying through in the next few minutes. Unfortunately, Sirius knew them. Let's see the ring again, Bella. Narcissa Black pleaded with her elder sister, felt Sirius stiffen, pressing himself backwards into the wall. 
Bellatrix preened, extending a long ivory arm. On her bony finger was an enormous, ugly silver and em emerald engagement ring, which she'd been flashing about since the start of term. Everyone in the school knew that she would be marrying Rudolf Lestrange, some wizard politician, as soon as she completed her newts. Sirius had to go to the wedding. Narcissa squealed when she saw it, though she'd probably seen it more than anyone else. Gorgeous, she gushed. Oh, I can't wait to get married. Wait your turn, Bellatrix replied, with a voice like nails on chalkboard. Once Lucius has a better position with the Ministry, I'm sure Mummy and Daddy will agree to the match. The two young women were standing before the brick wall now. Bellatrix was the taller of the two, but they looked very alike. They had long, black, curly hair, much like Sirius himself, and that same perfect black family bone structure. Mundus Sanguine, Bellatrix announced. The wall slid aside to let them in, and the four boys hurried after, as fast as possible before it closed. For the first time since he had been at Hogwarts, Remus was truly glad he had been placed in Gryffindor. The differences between their warm, comfortable common room and that of the Slytherins was stark. It was built like an enormous banquet hall rather than a sitting room. The walls were richly decorated with yet more elegant tapestries. The fireplace was huge and ornately decorated, and a ghoulish green pallor hung over everything. More than that, the place felt somehow wicked. Remus tried not to shudder. The other boys seemed as uneasy as he was, and they all froze still until James prodded them forward, up a flight of stairs, which they all hoped led to the boys' dormitories. On their way, they passed Severus sitting alone in a corner, hunched over his potions textbook. At the top of the stairs, they entered the first open door, which was, thankfully, a bedroom. James threw off the cloak. Keep a look out, eh, Petey? he said, hurrying into the room. Reckon one of these is Snape's bed? This one might be, Sirius pointed. Sheets look greasy enough. All four boys snickered. Quick then, lads. Gloves on, James whispered, unscrewing the jar. Remus and Sirius pulled on a dragonhide glove each, grabbed a handful of seeds and began scattering them underneath the bedclothes. They'll see them! James said, sounding disappointed. It was true. The bright red little seeds stood out clearly against the white sheets, even in the dark. Well, they'll still get it on them trying to brush them out, Sirius offered. Hang on, Remus had a sudden idea. He didn't know how it had occurred to him, or why, but somehow he was just sure it would work. He pulled out his wand, bit his lip and waved it gingerly over the bed as where he had just scattered the seeds. Obscovate, he whispered, and just like that, the seeds were gone. Well, he knew they were still there, but no one would be able to see them now. Blimey, James started. How did you do that? Flitwick hasn't taught us that charm yet, has he? Was it in the reading? Nah, Remus shrugged. I saw some of the fifth years doing it yesterday, to some sweets they'd bought in the village. It's not hard to copy. Sirius and James immediately attempted it themselves over the seeds they had just scattered. It didn't work the first time, or the second, but after the third, James had managed to vanish most of his. You'd better do it, Lupin, or will we be here all night, he decided. Yes, please hurry up, Peter hissed from the doorway, white with fear. Sirius tried a few more times before giving up and letting Remus take over. You're going to show me exactly how to do that as soon as we're back on neutral territory, he said. Remus nodded, though he wasn't sure how to explain it. He really had just done it because he thought he probably could. Next room, James announced, pulling them back into the entranceway. Do we have to? Peter asked, hopping from foot to foot. Isn't that enough? Not even close, Sirius replied with a laugh tossing his head. What if we haven't even got Snape's bed yet? We have to get them all, Pete. Are you with us or not? All the boys, anyway, James said, 
as they entered the next bedroom. I don't fancy our chances on getting into the girls. Remember what happened to Dirk Creswell last week. They worked quickly and managed to get every single boy's room, even the last one, which had sl three sleeping students in it, six years. Even Sirius had begged not to go in there, but Remus was giddy with the excitement of the prank and threw on the invisibility cloak to go in himself. He even scattered the rose hips over the pillows of the sleeping boys. By the time they had finished, it was getting late and more and more Slytherins were heading upstairs for bed. Barely able to contain their glee, the four Gryffindors hid under the cloak and slowly crept back down the stairs, flattening themselves against the wall any time someone was coming, then through the enormous stately common room and out through the walls they had come in. As James had instructed, they all kept as quiet as possible, until they were within splitting distance of Gryffindor Tower, and it was finally safe to remove the cloak once more. Windershins, they all chanted at the fat lady, who swung open for them. It was bliss to be back in the warm, bright Gryffindor common room, and they all threw themselves into the nearest available sofa, grinning insanely at each other. Frank Longbottom called to them from his desk, where he was tidying up revision notes. Cutting it fine, lads. Been somewhere interesting? Peter looked uncertain, but James just waved a hand. Library, obviously. Frank shook his head, though he was smiling. I'm sure I'll hear about it soon enough. I wish I could be there when it all kicks off, Sirius whispered, his eyes shining with joy. And I wish even more we could have got my cousins. It's just the beginning, serious mate, James replied, slapping the other boy's knee. Between the four of us, I reckon we could go even bigger next time. Excellent first mission, men, Peter whimpered. F f first mission? <laughs>